klassiek, klassiek opa, dan ben ik. Ik heb mijn leden als bed was al die ik. Je was ezek. Dat je in mijn tijd bent, je was ezek. Ik heb mijn leden als ellipse, heel tegen jou. I want to welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome you to the to the ceremony, to the event that, first of all, pays tribute to the children who lost their lives in the residential schools, and also to honor the survivors of residential schools as well. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that we're on that we're on traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of my ancestors, Wulastgui ancestors. The first language of this area where UNB sits now is the language of my ancestors, Wulastgui language. And in that language, of course, are our songs, our worldviews, our ceremonies, our traditions. And my ancestors passed on those teachings to the succeeding generations. The first teachings of this land, of this area where UNB sits, are the teachings of my ancestors. Teachings of love, of respect, of honoring others, of sharing. These were passed down to, to, to each succeeding generation. So we have to remember the teachings of this land, Wulastuguk. The teachings of Wulastuk, our beautiful and bountiful river. And of course, the language of this land. So thank you for being here to pay tribute to the children who lost their lives and also to honor our survivors. In the program for this morning, we will ask, first of all, a Blossom West to come up and do the opening prayer and ceremony. And, and a Blossom West will conduct the ceremony. And then we, all, we will also have uh, Elder Charles Nicholas from Tobik First Nation. So while we're smudging, cleansing of the mind, the body, and the spirit, Charles, Charles, uh, Elder Charles Nicholas will sing an honor song for those children who lost their lives. So I'll ask Abulasumas to come up and start the opening ceremony, please. Abulasumas nukmas dliwiya gopan, genangizikalama gendwek and wizwan, nidnid wulamsadazwag and bemkiskak. Today, I, I come to you in my traditional name, Ablasamwes. I'm a day school survivor. In my day school, in my community of Tobik, I wasn't allowed to use my traditional name. And so I honor all those who had traditional names that were told their names were insignificant. And so the symbolism that you see and I so appreciate the glow of orange. That's what we need to do as a people is to glow. Glow the love within us so that it doesn't happen again to any other child. We should never forget this. We should never forget what happened. Truth hurts and the truth that's coming, that's been confirmed. I know Phyllis Webstead herself said, those bodies weren't discovered, they're confirming what the truth is and the truth that was trying to be hidden. And so we carry that and we should carry it without trying to wipe away that sorrow. That sorrow is going to teach us. So, as this, uh, and so what we do is when we do the smudge, the shell that I brought is actually from the Haidegwe that was gifted to me in 1997 in New Zealand. And I thought it appropriate that out west, as we're all thinking about them, 
that we bring their gift of the sea to this ceremony. I'm having, I'm carrying a shawl from out west. It's the frog clan, which has, which means cleansing. The dome that you see in our sweat lodge is rebirthing, rebirthing of ourselves. Yes, we can't go back into our mother's wombs, but Earth Mother has provided a womb for us to sometimes go and unburden what we carry that's difficult for us. I brought handprints from our children at the school. I asked them to put some of the language on there to honor the language of the students who didn't get to learn theirs or who were told that their language isn't the language. We have sweetgrass, the first thing that was done to our children when they went to residential school was their braids were cut off. Today we see and we braid our children's hair again to let them know it's okay to be indigenous. It's okay to show your pride in your culture. Yesterday I had a sacred ceremony at our school. We had a sacred fire. The sacred fire is a symbol of igniting our passion, our passion for change, our passion for Bilwi Dahaz Walsawagan, which literally means reconcile action. The young girls in our school, all the way from 18 months old to grade six, use that cup that I have on our altar, the copper cup, and they poured a little teardrop onto Earth Mother to represent the tears of our people and all peoples who share our grief. The young men put tobacco into the sacred fire to feed the spirit of all peoples to remind us that we should be living in unity within diversity or diversity as a gift and not a weapon. We flew the flag, we took it to her honor. Lieutenant Governor accepted a flag that my children at the school hugged before it flew. I told the children, hug this flag. It's going to her honor's house today and every citizen of New Brunswick will see it, but sometimes they see it without the love that it represents. Every child hugged that flag. I could see the real love that they were given to that flag. And so when we rose it up high, which will be flying half mast today, the wind will share that love in our province hopefully even to the ones who didn't think today was a day of mourning. This, the, the, you know, the smudge that we're carrying, it's cleansing negativity to replace it with positive energy. The eagle fan will let the eagles know that there's prayers awaiting for them to spread throughout our territory. And of course, all of the, the basket of knowledge that our president keeps for this campus. You'll notice the handle symbolizes the spirit of our campus. The knowledge that's going to continue for generations yet to come that will be put into that basket. And of course, the moccasins symbolize our relationship with creation, our four-leggeds. They didn't just provide McDonald's to us, as I tell the children. They also provided their skin so we could make moccasins, drums. And so we have to constantly give gratitude for that sacred gift of creation and honoring our four-leggeds. 
we also have to remember the tobacco. People may wonder why tobacco, but tobacco is a gift of gratitude. Our tobacco doesn't have any chemicals, it's red willow tobacco. And our children are learning how to make that tobacco instead of having to go to the store to buy the one that makes them addicted. So today, as we gather, I give gratitude for our one mind here today, why we're here. Nolas Waltham Chilk, Kadina Meetwek, I give gratitude for her vision of a safer school learning environment for all our children. Kusetunin, when the sage comes around, it'll just be in a spiral way and a song will follow. And think about your loved ones. Think about the ones that need those hugs, but also honor that we get to walk our earth walk. Those children whose spirits we mourn today are teaching us in the same way our petroglyphs were left behind by our ancestors of, you know, something to know for the future. Well, those children are telling us what our future should be. Healthy, safe, earth walk. And when we do that and we walk and leave good tracks for future generations, then those stars will be lit brightly tonight. So I've been asking people to put a candle in the window to see our city lit up with the light of hope and love and compassion. I give gratitude to each and every one of you for the heart medicine that it took for you to be here today with us. Leewin, I'm going to let Elder Charles explain the song he's going to sing for you. I um, had a uh, session with our judges this morning, and, and I said it's kind of symbolic that I, you know, start the day after a pipe ceremony to um, talk to those who promote truth in their courtrooms. But I wanted truth to be carried outside of the courtrooms too, to each and every one of us. Liwen, Gazal Mulpa, Thank you, and know that you're loved so that you can share that love. Depsu, Elder Charles. Test, okay, there you go. I don't need to be that close. Well, as well, tell you the bad guy, Muslim Sajid Club and the Louise. I am very grateful to be asked to come and share this song. This song has a lot of this song has a lot of meaning. Um, at times, I do get emotional when I sing this song. At times, um, and the reason why I get emotional is because um, in my family, um, I have survivors. In my family, I've seen the RCIP come and take the children from the addicts, forcing them out of the home. I've seen all that. So this is why this song is so... When I first heard this song from a good friend of mine, Junior Peter Paul, he's my Micmac brother from PEI, and I had asked him if I could have the right to translate it to our language. And this is where this song originally came from, was from my buddy Peter. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, um, so the song itself, I asked him to explain the meaning to me so I could also explain it to everybody else that's here and every time I sing it. Um, the song itself, it's about the eagle flying around. 
I've been asked over the years during my traditional path, why do we honor the eagle? Well, we honor the eagle because the eagle is the highest flying bird, closest to our creator. And the eagle is always searching, always searching, going around in circle. And if you notice, the eagle's always going clockwise. It doesn't go back, it moves forward. It's searching all the time. So we all know this eagle flying around found the children. I cried that day when I heard about the children. So the eagle is flying around looking for these children. Right? And then he's flying around, he finds the children. There's five verses to this song, those are the first two. The third verse is, well, we found the children, what are we going to do now? Well, we're going to help these children. We're going to help them through their life. We're going to know, we're, they're going to know the truth. And this is what this is all about. This day is about the truth and reconciliation. It's a start. We all need to work together. The fourth verse on this one is about giving the children good medicine, the right teachings that they need, respect, honor, dignity. This is what this song is about. The fifth verse is we need to teach them the right path to take, not the wrong path. We cannot refuse any child that is looking for help, whether or not they're on drugs. The day they come to you for help is the day they need that help. You should not send them away. You accept them, even if they're not your own. So this song is about the children, to honor the children. And this is what our vision, and I know this is what Junior Peter Paul's vision was when his song came to him through his fast was the eagle is looking out for the children. So when I sing this song, I ask each and every one of you to close your eyes and listen with your heart, not your mind. The chant in this song, and I've been asked this over and over again, um, what do the chants mean? Well, I was talking with my buddy George, my brother George over here, and I said, the best way I can explain that is picture your child, very first hockey game, very first ballet performance, and they do really good. They get their first goal. She does that perfect spin. How do you react to that, being a parent? Do you go, yay, wow? Or do you go, yeah? A chant is how you feel in your heart. How you feel in that moment. So when I say at times when I do this song, I cry. Tears come out of my eyes. I can't stop them. I won't stop them. But that's what I mean when we say the chants are how you feel. The words are prayers. These are prayer words. Our songs, the holistic songs, are prayers. So I hope that you can listen with your heart. I start off with the four beats. And I have to stay back because I got a big mouth. Uh, 
As David is finishing his um, uh, offering smudge, the, the blessing that we have, I'll just um, uh, it, it help introduce the next speaker. I have Elder George Paul that will share. And Lewin Walalin, Waliel Sitbuk George, and uh, Elder George. Thank you, Melda, for introduction and uh, welcome everyone here today uh, <clears throat> to talk a little bit about uh, my experience at a residential school. I was taken to residential school when I was about eight years old, and I do believe I, I was there for at least uh, five years, going home every summer, 
like after the school term, I would go home. And I, it might have been one, one or two times that out of that that um, I had to stay all summer. And there were a few others that stayed all summer. <clears throat> Residential school experience varies with everybody that went there. Some had a very, very hard time. <clears throat> and I, I didn't really realize it myself till later that my father also went there and some other community members you know that were uh, um, like uh, adults that were in our community at the time like <coughs> it was a, a few people from our community that went, that went there along with my father during that time. So I guess it would be like that with all the other uh, reservations that were in uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and, and even Newfoundland, because uh, we had, had some people from Newfoundland who was there. But it was the Atlantic region, I think, that they were mostly targeting with uh, Mi'kmaq and Wolastikiak people. So, um, when I first went there, there was a lot of there was a lot of children there, boys and girls. I think we numbered over 170 on on the boys' side, and probably just as much on the girls' side. And nuns and priests were running the place. They had a couple of other. Um, people from nearby communities that were hired on as supervisors, but they were non-native, and uh, I don't I don't know what their concerns were at the time, but they were following orders and the form of discipline was was harsh in some cases, but I'll take you to this part where. Um, that day when they came to pick us up. My mother and father had separated due to um, difficulties that were happening in their lives. As you know, alcoholism is running rampant in, in most um, um, First Nations communities back in those days. You're talking about, you know, the early 60s, actually it was 1960, around about that time too, when it happened. There was, uh, unemployment was nil, pretty well on, in the community, unless the men went out and actually go work somewhere like a, a lumber camp, which was one of the most uh, um, ideal jobs for them to take because it paid good money, but they had to leave home. I had to go to a lumber camp and stay in a, and stay in a lumber camp. Other than that, they would be going to work for farms, labor jobs. But you know, they, you had to try to make a living somehow. I remember even uh, when I was younger, I, I used to see my father um, trapping beaver, muskrat, just trapping animals really and uh, selling the hides. That was a way of living. I mean, there was, there was nothing else. There were no programs like you see nowadays, not, no such thing. There wasn't even a band office in our community. So, you know, you know, we had one chief and maybe one or two counselors, depending on the size of the communities. Communities were small. So we were, we were already uh, in a situation that was, was very challenging. We didn't get much support, financial support from, from anywhere. So when situations got really bad, I, I guess maybe this, is, this was their answer, this was uh, the alternative, was to go and scoop up as many children as possible 
and take them to a residential school. And I'm just guessing, but I mean like the, the mentality behind that could be true, that it was part of a process and a policy they had implement, were implementing uh, called assimilation. They wanted to assimilate the indigenous people into society and conform into, you know, what uh, society dictates. That meant taking uh, a force, forceful measures by going out and, and actually collecting up the children and taking them to the residential schools so they can be educated into the system. That meant um, they had to um, whitewash our, our people. And by doing that, it meant that, you know, the, there was a process in place to take the culture away from the people, take the identity away from the people, and streamline our people to be part of society, blend into society. That's what you call simulation that was going on. But <clears throat> it went a little further than that. Apparently, it went into um, abuses and and things because they're, they're given the, the authority to do almost anything. When they're given that much authority, who knows what, what they're going to do? And who knows what happens behind closed doors? On, and on top of that, who cares? So, you know, we were totally at a disadvantage and taken, uh, taken for granted to the point that they can do. They're going to scoop us all up, and it's called 60 scoop now, all the children, and just um, um, beat the Indian out of them, their identity, who they are. And so when they arrived at the door, we were just kids, and we were staying in uh, people that lived across the road from us, just people in the community, trying to help out if somebody was in a bad situation. My mother had gone to her mother's place in Ristigush. My father went to a lumber camp. They had broken up in a fight, and then we were children. We wind up living with the, with the neighbors. And so it was then that we were, again, at a, a vulnerable. And they came, and they found that there was... There was an agent there to kind of like oversee what's going on in the, in the reservations. Uh, I'm not going to reveal his name, but uh, I know his name. I know who he is and because I saw him that day. And he was a sheriff, truant officer or whatever. But he came and pulled up and told the guy there at, that was looking after us that he had no rights that he was, he was the sheriff and he was going to take these children and uh, they're going to the residential school. So it was myself and my two, two older sisters. And um, the man that was looking after us and the woman, they said to us, you know, they're going to take you. He told us in Mi'kmaq, they're going to take you. And a fear just went right through, right through us. You know, that you can't do nothing. And he was trying to argue with them, and when we got an opportunity to run out the door, and I, and I ran as fast as I could. I mean, I'm just, you know, seven, eight-year-old kid, and I'm running like a son of a gun through the bushes, in the back of their house, went right down to the river, and I was I was trying to hide from from these people that were going to take us. <clears throat> so I thought about I don't know what happened to my sisters, but but I wanted to hide. I wanted to maybe kind of listen to what's going on, and I was hiding behind this tree, and I thought they wouldn't see me because they had 
low hanging branches and was sitting there. And I could hear them walking through the path because there was a path all along the river. There was, and they were talking. And I could, I could kind of see them going through the trees a little bit here and there as they're going down the path and I'm kind of moving, hiding behind this tree so they wouldn't see me. And all of a sudden somebody grabbed me and he shouted, I got him. So they must have snuck up behind me or something. I didn't see them and just grabbed me and, you know, carried me uh, back up there and I was kicking and screaming, trying to, trying to escape. And, and they took me and put me in the, in the car. There was a big car there. Put me in there and shut the door. And I was crying and, you know, screaming, you know, where's, uh, where's my sisters? Next thing you know, they brought them in. The doors opened, they closed. And the guy started up the vehicle and, and started driving. And he told us, you know, you gotta keep quiet. And I was crying, my sisters were crying too. And we don't know where we were going, where they were taking us, but you know, um, that feeling that we had there was like, you know, like, who's gonna help us? Nobody's gonna help us. You can scream, you can holler, nobody's gonna help you here. And that guy up there is in charge of whatever's gonna happen to you. And he was going pretty fast. The only thing we look out the, the car window and you see everything going by really fast, so. And told us keep still. And we were still crying for a long ways until I, I think I cried myself to sleep. And I don't know, somewhere along the line he pulled over uh, to like, um, like a picnic area where they had picnic tables there and like just off the road there. I guess it, it probably was a Trans Canada being built at the time back then, but uh, somewhere halfway towards Nova Scotia, probably. I'm not sure where it was, but all I know it was this place where it was like a picnic table there. And he said, we're gonna have a lunch. So you guys are gonna go out and sit on the table, pick me up and sat me on the, on the little table there, picnic table. He brought out some food and I was resisting. I was like, you know, I'm not hungry. I'm not gonna eat. Not like this. I brought up the food anyway and, and he put it in front of me and said, eat. I said, no, I'm not gonna eat. I pushed it away and pushed it back again. He said, eat, you gotta eat. And I said, I don't wanna eat. Actually, I didn't say I didn't wanna eat. I said, because at the time, I didn't speak a word of English. I only know Mi'kmaq, that's all I know. So my sisters were trying to, trying to help and they're telling me, you know, you know, you should eat, you know, he might beat you or something. And I, and I was still sitting there like this. And finally he came over and, and he took that sandwich and he shoved it in my face, just like that. And he said, eat, he was shoving it in my face. And that's, that's when I just jumped up and, you know, I just started running again. I started running down that road that goes up there. And the Trans Canada, I guess is what it was. And I, there was woods on the other side of the road there, right? So I started running towards those woods. And I was running as fast as I could and he was coming behind me. And there was a truck that was coming. I could hear that great big transport truck coming, coming up, the, up the road, right? And I, I ran across the road anyway, and I just made it across the road, and uh, I heard my sisters, my sisters calling out, you know, don't, don't go nowhere, stay with us. And, and for that second, I, I, I stopped right there, and that truck just went by like, Whoa. I mean, just like, just, I think it must have just grazed me, but the wind from that truck, kind of pushed me into the, the gravel that I was standing on. There was a, like, a, like a ditch there, just kind of slid right down. That wind just made me slide right down into the ditch. 
And when I was rolling down there, after the truck went by, this is when uh, the, that guy came in and got me and took me back. And he said, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to eat and you have to we'll be taking this break and we're going to go. So anyway, he put me in the car I was afraid I was going to run away again, and then I, and I, was, I was crying in the car. I was looking out at my sisters there, and there, he was telling me eat, so they ate. And, and he was when he was done, settled, and we all kept on going again. And my sisters got on, and you know they were, we were all kind of like hugging and kind of sh um, comforting ourselves. And then I, I guess I fell asleep again on the, on, the, on the way there. When we got there to the residential school, I remember driving up that big hill because it was on a hill. There was a grove of trees right in front there. And this place looked like a castle. They had lost like a great big arch like right in the center with stairs that go up, wooden stone stairs that went up. And I think it was about... Uh, Three or four stories, I think it was four stories, maybe five stories high, with a big cross right in the center, big white cross in the center. And um, there were all these people gathered around. It was almost like, uh, uh, I mean, I, after you see all of that stuff on TV and everything nowadays, like a celebrity getting off a vehicle, right? And you get all these people like coming out to see them, taking pictures or whatever, right? There was a, there was a big focus on on us at, at that day, because the nuns and priests were at the, on the steps, and, and the guy pulled up there. He opened the doors and stood us up, and took my sisters on that side, stood it for just a few steps over from from the the big archway there, and then all the girls that were already there. You know, um, over a hundred of them, they're all uh, white, like a white shirt and a blue skirt. And all the boys, are, they're all, everybody was dressed all, almost all the same. Eh? So, and all the boys were standing there. So they kind of displayed us and said, you know, this is uh, on the boy's side for me, the guy uh, came over and greeted uh, the person that, dropped us off there. And then uh, the, the priest and the brothers came over and told the, the, all the boys side, and there was over 100 of them there, and they ranged anywhere from, from my age up to eight years old up to 16. So they're all different, different age, uh, age categories there. And they're all kind of like standing in a big crowd there. And they said, you know, this is, um, you know, told them my name and where I came from, and it's going to be part of the part of the family there now, part of the school, you know, wel welcome him here. And um, for me, uh, like at at the time, I didn't I didn't really understand too much of because I didn't understand very much English, right? But I mean, reflecting back. I put it all together now. But I didn't understand what was going on, you know, because, uh, you know, I saw all these kids standing in front of me there, and, and they, they were saying, new guy, new guy is here, right? new guy, new guy, new guy. They were all saying, new guy, new guy. And you know, in Mi'kmaq, that's the only thing that, that sounds to me, it's a word in Mi'kmaq, new guy means I'm on fire. They're all saying, new guy, and it's also like, am I, am I on fire, or who's on fire? You know, new guy. <laughs> but I guess I was on fire, all right, that day, you know, because um, everything was going to change right, right from there on, you know. My life was going to change. And so these guys uh, were, that were all shouting out, no guy, no guy, they're saying, well, he's going to be my friend, he's going to be my friend, right? You know, he's going to be my buddy and stuff like that. So I, I didn't 
quite understand what was going on there, but I mean, I, I found out later, you know, this is, this is what happened. They took us in, they took us into the laundry room, they called it. The laundry room was, was run by a woman there that lived nearby there that was hired to, to, to do all the sewing, sewing room. And uh, sewing room and laundry room it was, because she was uh, kind of in charge of all the kids' clothes. And didn't really know all the kids, but she knew by the numbers. So everyone was assigned a number. So first thing was I was assigned a number. Your number is going to be, you know, and they give you a number, and you're going to give you a locker. And you're, you, there's, you're assigned to a locker where you keep all your clothes for the day, your shoes, stuff, and you have, you're, you're responsible to take care of them. You're assigned a room, um, um, in a bedroom, you're assigned where the bed, your bed's going to be, your number's going to be on the bed, that's where you go. You look after that bed. You're assigned a closet where you keep your Sunday clothes. All your Sunday clothes are, are the best clothes, so they're separate from your other clothes, or so they're kept in a, a Sunday locker. It's like a little suit and tie and stuff like that, and shiny shoes, separate clothes from, from your other everyday clothes. So you had your school clothes that you put on when you go to school. And you had your recreation clothes, jeans and boots and stuff, playing outside and whatever. So all, all of that was kind of regimental, you know. But they put us through that process, and that was the routine. And you had to know that, and you had to understand that. And it's just some, some of the ways that they, they, when they did the laundry, the laundry wasn't brought to you, nice folded and everything like that. They just dumped it all on the floor and you go and find your number. You know, they brought the socks in, you go find your socks with your numbers on it. You know, and so when we went in, before we went into, uh, um, it was kind of regimental. I'll walk you through this a little bit. In the morning when we get up, you stand by your bed until the supervisor comes and Checks everything is over because some of people that were there wet the bed, peed the bed, or whatever. And maybe it's because of trauma they had in their lives. And I had a lot of trauma in my life as well back home. So, and this was all trauma to me. So I wet the bed. So they assigned me to the wet bedroom. There's a whole dormitory there where wet beds are. You open the door and you're in the, you smell. The pee everywhere, right? It's in the air everywhere. And so they would get up, uh, get us up midnight, sleeping or not, pull you out of bed, stand you up, sit, push you up, go to the bathroom, and without any guidance, they say, go to the bathroom. I mean, there is a bathroom area there that you, that you can go into. It's the doorway that goes in there. But some of these kids were just half asleep, so they would walk into a corner, they'd be peeing in the corner. They might have been peeing on somebody else's bed, you know, because they're asleep and they're just told go and pee, you know, you know real fast to get everybody up. And, and uh, so they, they had to get control of that so that that won't happen. And sometimes they'll walk you right to the bathroom door and then you go in. And they didn't give us pajamas, they gave us a nightgown, it's just a nightgown, that's all you had on. Because they know you're going you're gonna to pee in that, that night. And every night, every one of us peed the bed. And it's, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but the reason why was, uh, you know, that we were traumatized. We go through traumatized, you pee the bed. There was a thing, a reaction to that, pee the bed at night. And some of the other guys would even do both, one and two. There was one fellow I know that was, every morning he'd get up, he'd, he'd be brown from his knees up to his neck because he'd been rolling around in his feces all night. You know, um, he was severely traumatized, you know. But I don't know if they cared for that or not. It didn't matter. They just wanted to beat it out of you, you know, that you had to toughen up or whatever. But that was uh, um, one of the things they did is right to beat it out of you. You get up in the morning, if you peed the bed, you lean over your bed 
while the supervisor goes around with a strap and he beats you. Everybody got 10 strappings for peeing the bed that night. And he, he'd hit you hard. And some of them still wet, so uh, strapping with uh, wet butt, I mean, that, that hurts a lot, it stings. So that was just more traumatization on top of the other, right? It just didn't help anything. So that was, you know, that's kept the wet bed room alive anyway. There's a lot of wet beds. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go in a wet bed room because the other guys in the other room could hear the ones in the next room getting beat and crying. So that's even traumatizing for them to hear, to hear that going on. You know? um, and then uh, after that, then you had to go take a shower. You get, we all run and take a shower. And you had to do it in a certain amount of time because there's only a certain amount of time in a day. Then you had to wash up and then you stand in line. All the little kids from, to the big kids. You know, they're standing in line. And, and you had to stand like with your feet almost together with your hands by your side like this. Like, you know, like soldiers, right? And if you're looking around or if you're picking your nose or your ear or whatever, you know, you got what they call a demerit. Because the supervisor is just walking around. There's supposed to be no talking, no noise, and he's making, you know, these little marks on, on the paper. And at the end of the week, they add them all up and you say, well, you got 15 demerits, you know, because of moving around or talking or whatever during this time. And you got strapping for that, 15 straps. And if you pulled your hand away, they had another one on. So, and because after, you get hit after, after the first one, you feel the pain and you, you pull away on the next one and it gets even more, you don't even want to put your hand out. So they'll make sure, they force you to hold your hand out. They'll hold, get somebody to hold your hand out and they'll, they'll strap you really hard. Like, you know, they're almost like jumping off the ground to strap you. And those strappings will go all the way up to your arm here, right in the tender part of your arm right here. And it makes welts. And, you know, that, that is uh, more traumatization, traumatization on, on top of the other. So, you know, this, um, this, this is just the start of it. You know, and then, you know, you, you had to stand by uh, your chair when you go into a refectory to eat. You had to stand there until you say your grace, you know. So we'd, we'd say our, our grace and uh, sit down and eat. And when you're done eating, you say your you know, closing prayer with that, and then you're, you're out. But there was a lot, a lot of uh, abuses that took place there, you know, uh, amongst even the the children that were there against each other, and, and there was abuses from from the nuns and, and the priests that were that were there. Brothers, they call them. You know, there are all these abuses, sexual abuses, physical abuses, violence, violent stuff. I can't go into the details, but I'm just giving you a, an idea of what a residential school experience would have been for one person from go, from home to getting there, and while you're there, all what you had to go through, no contact with your family members. Maybe a letter once in a while. I never did get to see my grandparents. They died before I could really, you know, get to visit them. But I learned as years went on to get over it, and, and thanks to all the work that's now recently come out, and people getting involved and, and seeing the, the trauma and, and uh, the, the abuse that our people went through. And now a reconciliation is taking place and people are understanding it more. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll close. I can talk all day, but thank you so much, Imelda and, and Dave, for giving me the opportunity. Well, Arlene George, that was uh, George, Elder George Paul from Metapanagiak. Thank you for your sharing your experience at Shubanegadi. 
So now we have, um, we have uh, the President, uh, Paul Meserol, to say a few words. Pre Mr. President, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Um, just a, a look, I want to begin by uh, thanking Elder George Paul for sharing your reflections. They're very powerful um, hearing your story of your experiences and the experience of your family. So I think it's a very strong reminder of the journey that you took and your family took and thousands of children took. I have a few words I want to share on this important occasion. So in, in recognition of UNB's commitment to truth and reconciliation, it is really an honor for me to be here um, and a privilege for us to co-host this important event of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation um, with members of UNB's McMack Wistaquay Center. It's terrific to see so many of you here with us today to uh, honor this day and also to use it as a chance to reflect to share, to learn, and to hear more about the legacy of the survivors, uh, but the impact on families and children and communities um, through this period in our history. It is an opportunity also to acknowledge and recognize the history and the legacy of residential schools and highlight the need for our community to commit to actions in support of truth and reconciliation. And this day is also an example for how we can come together to learn, to listen, to grow, to understand. And it is really pleasing to see so many of you here in the Curry Center to share in this important event. Of course, when, when I first heard of the discovery of the 215 young children buried on the grounds of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School back in the spring, like most of you, um, I was shocked. It was obviously um, a terrible revelation for all of us. But I was perhaps not surprised um, at this part of our history. As shocking as it is, um, it's a history that many of us don't understand. It's a part of our history that many of us um, perhaps would like to forget, but we must not because it is a shameful history. But it does um, create an opportunity, I think, for reflection. And I've certainly had a chance to reflect upon that legacy and that part of our history. And there's three major takeaways that I can draw upon um, through that process. The first is the scale of the tragedy. So we're not, and what are the dimensions of this tragedy? So we're talking about young children experiencing abuse, neglect, young children who were buried without ceremony, young children who, um, whose history um, could have become forgotten. We're also talking about the impact on survivors and the reflections on the intergenerational trauma that it's had on them and their families and their communities. And the, the stories that we've heard just, just now by Elder George Paul is just a powerful reminder of that legacy, of that history, of those experiences. The impact on these poor children, the impact on these families, the impact on these communities. So that is one aspect of the tragedy, of our need to reflect upon and understand and listen and learn. I think a second reflection for me has been, why didn't we know more? Why as a young children, young child growing up in Canada, how come we weren't taught this in our schools? So I think that is a lesson and a need for us to be asking questions about our history and how we how we recognize our history, how we um, understand our history, and how we share our history um, for the educators, for the next generation of, of young people, and uh, so that they can grow up and reflect upon this aspect of history which affected our community. Um, 
And I think as, as part of that telling of history, we need to be asking those questions of what happened, to whom did it happen, why did it happen, and what, what, what can we learn from what happened to ensure it doesn't happen again. So that's my second reflection. My third is, what can we do about it? What must we do about it? What must we do in response? So of course we need to never forget. We must acknowledge this history. We must have an authentic recollection and an authentic understanding to listen, to learn, to raise our awareness. So as educators, we must use our skills our agency to impart this history, uh, whether it's our students or our colleagues or our friends or our, through our networks. So we must commit to learn, we must commit to do more, we must commit to truth and reconciliation, and we must commit to truth and reconciliation. action, that words are not enough, so we must do more. So as educators and as administrators of universities or schools or, or other kinds of entities, there really is an opportunity to do more, that we need to put authenticity into our actions. Um, we need to, particularly from a university context, look for opportunities to build bridges of understanding so that we can connect our past to our present and our future. So we need to be looking for answers and common ways to understand. So as university leader and as colleagues at this university, we want to build those bridges of understanding. We want to raise awareness. We want to raise understanding. Um, and we want to do our part to reconcile this history, learn from it, and commit to, to do more and to do better. That's my commitment to you. And I'm pleased to see you all here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Next, we have uh, Elder Andrea Simon from Elsie Bogdok First Nation. Andrea? Hello. Okay. Kwe am Sidwen. Kwe and Megama. It's very easy word. It uh, depends on where you. Doesn't matter the spelling. Some it's K W E with an accent day on the end. And what it means is uh, when you say Kwe, what it means is you're acknowledging that other person shine. Imagine, eh? What a great way to start reconciliation when you meet somebody, eh? You greet them and you, you acknowledge that beautiful shine that they have. That's wonderful. Myself too, uh, like many of our indigenous folks, uh, we had traditional names, but we weren't allowed to use them. And some of us gain our traditional names later in life like myself. My traditional name is which means red willow medicine. I received that later in life. When I was a youngster, I, I survived a 60 scoop. I had a little bit different experience from George. Uh, when I, uh, I had a mother that passed away as a child and uh, after the funeral, the following day, uh, strange agents, uh, foreign people took me to a foreign house with foreign language and culture. I didn't know what they were saying or anything. The similar experiences as George. And then, uh, you know, back and forth to the reservation, and then I became a day school student. And uh, in, my, in my earlier career, I worked a lot with the Indian residential school survivors. And uh, I got to meet almost 1,000 of them here on the eastern seaboard. 
And uh, that included Inuit children from Labrador. And uh, when the discovery of the, or when, they, when the children uh, presented their truth to the world in BC, you know, right away I was very uh, hurt and, and many feelings like everybody else. But I was really angry and, and angry at myself because, because I went to a lot of the adjudication hearings with everybody that went there. I know, hey, eh? I, I know where, uh, I know why uh, Mr. Robertson, uh, you know, did the perpetual care of his lawn a certain way because there was, you know, graves there. And I had to struggle with myself because, you know, I, I signed a paper with the person that was there in front of government and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, their, their people. And, it's, and I had to sign that promise that I'm never going to say exactly what that individual went through. Eh? So I had to go through a lot myself. You know, I wanted to get up and take a shovel and go down to Shubanagadi eh? and start digging myself. But, you know, I can't do that because I, I, kept, I have to keep my promise. I went and, and uh, I was given information from a lot of survivors. They were married, some of them, over 50 years, and they never even said that to their spouses, see? Eh? So I know that's really sacred stuff. But that's a sidebar from what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. I just want to just give you a little bit about me, eh? I'm, I'm a survivor too, but a different kind of a survivor. And uh, many, uh, many of us uh, survived uh, lots of different things. I'm also a survivor of a missing, murdered uh, family member. And, uh, but I also wanted to acknowledge uh, th that I'm invited to come to the unceded, unsurrendered territory of my cousins, my Wolostogoy cousins, because we're from the same confederacy. And, and they're wonderful cousins. And uh, we always helped each other out. And, um, Today I, I came here and uh, I had this long thing to talk about, but I'm not going to really go there because, you know, it's going to take uh, more than, we won't be uh, here. We won't leave when we're supposed to. I also want to acknowledge Natasha Simon, and I want to offer my condolences because her grandmother was... The, the, the last, the oldest residential school survivor in the Eastern Seaboard. And yesterday she was buried. And it's really difficult when we look into our communities, just like the veterans, our survivors are almost all gone. And I really felt bad because I had to go there and go like that to my brother. Eh? Because it's really important that we take that time and opportunity to listen to them. So maybe next year when we plan, you know, we can, we can, have, a, we can have George speak as long as he wants and, you know, different kioshes or stuff. But this is our first time and we're doing good. But I just wanted to, to acknowledge, uh, you know, when we look at trauma, and things that are very difficult in our history. Creator gave us right hand and left hand. Eh? And with our right hand, we got our years and our hardships and everything that we've gone through. But with our left hand, because it's closer to our heart, we have to look at the balance and the things about reconciliation and the acts of reconciliation that we can do for ourselves, for our family, for our communities, and for our nation. And to, not to set unexpected, not to, not to make uh, unexpected, uh, unrealistic goals. Eh? We have to be very patient with one another. And we can't change time and we can't, you know, go as far as we need to go or want to in this little lifetime that we have. But we can do little things every day, eh? Like I wake up and I tell my family, and I'm going to tell you, I like to take this opportunity to say I'm sorry. 
if I've ever offended you through a text, through a, through a, a facsimile, or even words, eh? Because, you know, I, I, I suffer MS, so I'm just getting over about, you know. But we used to start our meetings that way. And in Skodombadish, I used to go there once a week, every day, every, every, for a few years. And I used to start that way about reconciliation. And I would put symbols about reconciliation on the walls, different principles. And you know, at first they used to look at me like to say, what is she doing? And after a while, they started to warm up to what I was doing in a professional meeting. And then one fellow looks over to the other fellow across from the boardroom. And they, they uh, did what I did. And you know, those men worked in the same building over 10 years, and they didn't speak. And each one forgot why <laughs> it was so long. But you know, they didn't become friends, but they became cordial, and they faced the issue they needed to do is reconciliation. In our way of life, in the Mi'kmaq and the Wulustigo way, very similar. And I sat down with a couple of the uh, survivors from Nogotkok, and that's Tobik. And we talked about reconciliation. And I asked them, did you guys uh, go and uh, have ceremonies? What is your guys' beliefs about reconciliation? And you know, they had exactly the same thing as we did. And I talked to them about that cycle that uh, we uh, took five years to come up with. And um, it was all the same, the same as the Wulustugoe people. And that's what the survivors in, in uh, Nugutkuk really wanted, eh? was, was, was to learn about reconciliation. Because they felt that they had a lot to reconcile, you know, the harms for, uh, in their family, uh, for themselves, their grandchildren and children, and the whole community. And I always was so impressed and, and uh, felt so much honor that my friends endured so much hardship and pain, but they were the ones that were the champions for reconciliation. Imagine that. And I wanted to look at it like for the directions, eh? So the Eastern, that, are, that is our Wabanaki people and all the harms and hardships that they suffered, you know, with, with, with this hand, but with another hand, we can look and embrace at our opportunities that we have. And sometimes you have to live through a bad storm in order for good things to happen, eh? Sometimes with my trauma, all my years, I learned that you just sometimes got to sit still and just let the storm pass. And once it passes, you pick yourself up and you do what you need to do. And I wanted to, and I wanted to take this opportunity to ask, uh, to ask uh, in the southern direction, those warms, that warmth, eh? to melt that ice that gathers around our hearts and awaken those dandelions that, that, that bring, bring the spring. They're the ones that, uh, you know, bring the spring out. And the strawberry that comes after her, she's the leader of the plants. Melt our fears, melt our fragility, soften our hearts, remove hatred, and kindle love truth, reconciliation, within the sacred fire of our hearts, within the sacred fire of our Earth Mother. Teach us kindness, teach us justice, teach us mercy, teach us compassion as we enter into our world of a new platform. Today marks a new day we're never going to be the same people anymore. Today, ceremony has made us different. It's awakening of a consciousness, planting seeds. Eh? 
we're, we're, we've, it, it's kind of like these little children gave us a, like an anointment to, and, and, and washed our eyes and smudged, you know, cleared our minds. And, and planting these little seeds is wonderful. And then we look westward where Niskam lays his head or her head to rest, however you, you think of your own creation story and pray to that direction of the setting sun. And teach us before we lay to rest that we've done the best that we could with what little resources that we have in the eyes of reconciliation. Just like that little hummingbird, eh? One time this big bear, there was a freak forest fire and uh, everybody was running to the water and running away and this hummingbird kept going with one drop of water. A little four ounce little thing with one drop of water. And this big grizzly bear comes by and says, what do you think you're doing? He says, well, I'm doing what I can to stop this fire. And the big bear says, oh my God, you, you're an idiot. You think you can do all this? Stop this forest fire? And the hummingbird, all she said was, I'm doing what I can with what resources I have. And we have to be all those little hummingbirds. Sometimes when we think about the world and what has happened to our indigenous people all over the lands, it seems that it's uh, daunting and there's not much we can do. We could be that little hummingbird, just that little drop of water. Every day we can make changes, positive changes. And then to the north, reconciliation, to understand hardships each of us face this year. This is the first day of our year. It's a beginning. You can even think about it as this is our new year, eh? No beginning. This is a time when you let things go and you fill what you let go with good things. You fill up your basket like we have here in UNB with nothing but good things. and you and uh, reflect on the greatness and that we can show and, and look at what are the measures and how could we, what are the things that we can look back at here at UNB next year, five years, 10, 15 years on our acts of reconciliation and how we did things. I think it's gonna be a really good, good opportunity. And when we look at the sky, Daylight, we witness your beautiful canvas, creator, the bricolage of marble, and the countless stars at night. And, and sometimes that's an example. Eh? We have to face utter darkness to see the beautiful diamonds in the sky. And we've passed that. Now, we, now we're, we're, at a, we're at a good place where we can have a good start. Our earth mother beating, be, Beneath our feet, help us to give us thanks and thank you for loving us unconditionally. And please forgive us for how we hurt you. For our souls that each and every one of us act accordingly with respect and that we're all pipe carriers. Every one of us, Creator gave us a pipe stem and our bowls are, is our spirit. I don't believe that there's a creator that created 87 billion people and only picked 200 people to be pipe carriers. We're all the same. You're all sacred beings in this room. And we're also all equipped with the same equipment, our hands. You see, our hands are made unequal. Our fingers are not all the same length. That means Creator knew that we were going to face adversities. And it's up to us to help one another to find those tools again and use those tools so that we can help one another. And this is a reminder how we have to help one another. And that we use our sacred windpipe, your pipe, there are pipe people that, you know, they couldn't do bad things too. 
and, and a pipe. That's why some people put sage in their pipe so that somebody walks by and says, you know, something bad about somebody. A pipe only listens to whatever it, whatever it's told to do. So the good people, they protect their pipe so that only good things can happen. So you as a pipe carrier, use your pipe and put out good medicine. Hey, eh? Imagine if we all did that simultaneously. And um, not to speak ill of each other, but empower each other, you know? Empower each other. It's so easy when you look at somebody and say, oh my God, he's dead. You, you knock them down. But that's, that's not a good way. And um, I wanted to... Um, I wanted to talk about this hat, and um, I wanted to give it to Amelda. And the designs on here, it's, it says on there, truth and reconciliation. And these are our glyphs. Eh? Our glyphs, our people here in uh, the Wabanaki people, we all use our glyphs. And, and you, as young people, you want to copy these glyphs, go and use them, you know? Use them and promote them and put them in your paintings when you're doodling in your class and you don't want to listen to the teacher and, and you want the president to think you're listening. Draw these symbols <laughs> and, and look busy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, own them. Make T-shirts out of them. Uh, you know, uh, write letters to your family and, and write those symbols and teach them. And people are going to say, what are those funny writings? And, you know, you can say that, that means truth and reconciliation. It's simple lines, but you see, that's, that means a lot to me and to the elders and everyone because we all share with one another, right? Blending of minds. We're all coming together as one. And I like to thank the little children all over the place every residential school, unmarked grave, for, for bringing us all together. Eh? Because remember I said, sometimes it takes something horrible for something good to happen. And this is the something that's good that's happening. It's bringing us all together. And, I, and, and before I close, I want to touch on fragility, you know. I don't want you leaving here with heavy hearts and blaming yourselves you know, and carrying unnecessary guilt and shame. It doesn't belong to you. Leave it here, eh? Leave it here. And when you get smudged, just leave it. And uh, when you leave something, pick up something good. So when you leave fragility and hurt and shame and stuff like that, pick up things like awareness, uh, education, and kindness. Nogama. And I just want to, before I leave, I want to give my, my hat to my friend because she made, she gave us a beautiful presents last meeting. And I wanted to give her this because she really loves glyphs like I do. See you. Well, I'll in Elder Andrea Simon for sharing your thoughts on reconciliation, reconciliation. Um, I forgot to uh, mention that Elder Vaughn Nicholas from Tobik First Nation was going to be sharing his experience as well at Schopenhagen Residential School, but he couldn't make it for today. Uh, he had to, uh, apparently they're having a, a gathering of survivors at Res uh, Schopenhagen today, tomorrow, and, and Saturday. So, but he did agree to be, to be recorded, and we recorded him yesterday, and we were going to play uh, bits and pieces of the recording 
but apparently it's, it's almost two hours, two hours long. But what we've decided to do is that tomorrow it'll be posted on everychildmatters.ca and you can go to the site and listen to his story because you'll hear more of what George has shared as well as Elder, Elder Simon. Story, a painful story, painful experiences as he puts it and stories of being punished for speaking his language stories of a story about being mistreated in the in the school in the way that George Elder George Paul has also shared so so it'll be posted tomorrow if you're interested in listening to his story okay next we have uh, Dean Heidi McDonald uh, faculty of arts St. John campus Thank you, and good morning. About 10 years ago, I attended one of the TRC hearings, and I've been haunted ever since by the story of a frail, elderly woman in a wheelchair. She was very thin, and she had kind of faded red hair. And she spoke about eating toothpaste because she was so hungry. And she kept repeating, I was so hungry, I was so hungry. And that morsel of history penetrated my soul like no other piece of history. And I'm a historian. <laughs> it's taken us far too long to understand that our greatest learning is from listening. And I regret, as a historian, that I didn't understand earlier in my career that the, the full gratitude of residential schools. Today, our faculty and students are ready for reconciliation and they're ready to listen. In St. John this year, we've co-hosted with Eastern Circle St. John, an indigenous film series, and we've been working hard to include more indigenous content in all of our courses, and we are requiring Indigenous courses in our education program and our Bachelor of Health program. And lastly, we know, we acknowledge, we have a lot more work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dean McDonald. Next, we have someone from the Stony Union here uh, from the Fredericton campus. Okay. So I, I invite Kenna to the, uh, to, to the podium. There was no name on this, so that's why I had to ask her. Uh, so <laughs> my apologies. That's OK. okay thank, thank you. All right. All right, elders, fellow classmates, friends, Willie Zepuwu, good morning to you all. I would like to begin my address by acknowledging that the University of New Brunswick is situated on unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of the Wulistukwe and Passamaquoddy people, a land that stretches from Maine to the shores of the Bay of Fundy. We're all so blessed to share this land together. And it inspires me to know that we are all here today for one reason, to move toward a path of reconciliation. My name is Kiana Bear Hetherington, and I'm a proud Willistook Way woman from the beautiful community of St. Ansis, also known as St. Mary's First Nation. I'm the Nuji Budawazawin Indigenous Representative for the University of New Brunswick. I'm the daughter of an Indian Day School survivor and the granddaughter of a residential school survivor. 
I'm very humbled and honored to have been invited to participate in the very first National Truth and Reconciliation Day, which is also known as Orange Shirt Day. This important day is related to the story of Phyllis Webstad from the Canoe Creek Indian Band. On her very first day of residential school, she had arrived dressed in a new orange shirt, which was taken away from her. It is now a symbol of the stripping away of culture, freedom, and self-esteem experienced by indigenous children across generations. This has been a very difficult, inspiring, and very painful journey for all of us. Residential school experience is clearly one of the darkest and most troubling chapters of our collective history. My ancestors been, have been faced with physical, mental, spiritual, and sexual abuse from these institutions. The fact that my ancestors, as innocent children, were forcibly taken from their families and into a system that attempted to dismantle their culture, traditions, their language, and their ways of life sickens me. My grandfather had been forced to attend an Indian residential, residential institution. He was a survivor. The trauma he faced from the system had left him without the knowledge, skills, or tools needed to cope in either world. There is a history of substance abuse and physical abuse within my own family. This affects me personally as I did not get to know my own mother. She was faced with a lot of trauma in her childhood and struggles to this very day. Sadly, many families, not only in my community, but all of North America, are faced with similar experiences. This is a result of the intergenerational trauma placed upon Indigenous families by these cruel systems. Life for Indigenous people should not have been this way. My family and ancestors deserve to thrive as any other culture should. After hearing the traumatic stories from elders who were faced with these injustices, I'm left with overwhelming gratitude toward my ancestors for their resilience, their strength and courage, and especially for their honorable generosity of spirit to be willing to have a conversation still after everything. It is disheartening to see the current lack of Indigenous history and knowledge being taught in our provincial education system. It is crucial that we teach the history of colonization and genocide in the country that has been inflicted on Indigenous people. Growing up, I was completely unaware of my own culture and many parts of our history. It has taken me 14 years of education to finally be taught about Indigenous cultures, the cruel histories my ancestors face, and what we continue to face are contemporary manifestations of colonization. I feel as though part of my own identity has been stripped away from me. Unfortunately, my experience is not unique. Our culture deserves to be celebrated and is not something we should ever be ashamed of. None of us in this room are responsible for the sad history of Indigenous people in Canada, but we are all accountable for our actions today and moving forward. That is why it's such an honour for me to represent my nation and the Student Council here today to share in this proud occasion with you all and reinforce the qualities you all have within you as agents of change. We need allies. We need people to support and uplift Indigenous voices to enact effective change. We need allies in the healthcare system, justice system, education system, industrial and business sectors. We need people from all corners to help carry the message of truth and understanding so that more harmonious relations will prevail. Despite the provincial government's refusal to recognize Truth and Reconciliation Day, I'd like to say we'll leave one. Thank you to the University of New Brunswick for giving us this day to reflect. We'll leave one to all the speakers who have shared their knowledge and powerful messages before us, and we'll leave one for allowing me to share my own, all my relations. Thank you. Okay, next we have the, um, the video tribute uh, from the Wabanaki Bachelor of Education students. Now, I, I had a chance to attend uh, the class where they shared uh, their, um, their tributes. And I got emotional listening to the tributes from non-Indigenous students tri uh, paying tribute to the children who lost their lives in residential schools. I got emotional. These are powerful, so... So I'm not sure how this is going to work. Is that? Kwe Nola Lewis, Jennifer Peterson. I'm from Naguktuk, Tobik First Nation. And we've had the honor to um, do pay tribute to 
the residential school children that have been lost and that are now found. So, so Quay Nildley was Justine Tremblay, Nilnu Jayao Nagutguk, and we um, painted this hand drum to tell the story of the children's honor song sang by the Nagutguk drummers. So in the song, it states this grandfather eagle flies around Mother Earth searching for the children. Grandfather Eagle flies around Mother Earth and he finds the children. Grandfather Eagle flies around Mother Earth and he helps the children. Grandfather Eagle flies around Mother Earth and he gives the children good medicine, gives them good peas on. Grandfather Eagle flies around Mother Earth and teaches them their native ways. So that is our tribute to the children that Never made it home. Will you win go much? Will you win? Okay. That was my mistake. I was talking, uh, I actually, I was at that particular gathering as well and listened to the tributes from the Wabanaki students at McAdivic Lake. And then I also attended the, the last class for the First Nations education class. They shared their tributes as well. So, so that was my, my mistake. So now we would ha uh, we'll have uh, Dean Carol Nemiroff, uh, uh, Renaissance College. Good morning. My heart breaks for the children who were sent to residential schools and who never came home, and for the children who did come home with their spirits broken, and for the families of those children that were torn apart, and for the children and adults who continue to go missing and to suffer and experience injustices today, and for layer after layer of injury added to all of these griefs when no one listened even when the truth was plainly spoken until the children's graves were found and until horrifying videos were shown on the news. No one can go back and restore those children or their families, but we can make sure as a society and as individuals that nothing like this ever is allowed to take place again. We can commit to hearing truth when it is spoken and to making reparations where they are due. We can commit to going beyond lip service, beyond even symbolic support, although these are good starts, to actually engaging in actions uh, that bring healing and change. We know better, and it's long past time for us to do better. I have a packet of cedar and sage to offer to the spirits of the children who never came home. I received guidance this morning that this is most powerful, most appropriate when a child or a student um, makes the offering uh, because the children are our witnesses um, and the children are our future. So I'd like to invite a child or a student or a parent on behalf of a child to uh, accept this package of cedar and sage, uh, to take it outside after the ceremony and offer it with prayers, uh, put it in the ground with prayers. If someone is willing to do this, thank you. And I offer commitment from the heart on behalf of Renaissance College to do what is within our power to nurture and support and empower indigenous leaders now and for the future. We'll start off as the hummingbird and perhaps with support and working together, we'll grow into a fire truck. Thank you, Dean Nemiroff, for your, for your um, words. 
Um, next, we have the Student Representative Council from the St. John campus. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having us. My name is Charlotte Fanjoy. I'm the president of the UMB Students Representative Council on the St. John campus a settler on the Willistic Way territory, and an ally to all indigenous peoples in Canada. My name is Kirsten Hurley. I'm the Vice President Finance and Operation of the UMBSRC on the St. John campus, a settler on Willistic Way territory, and an ally to indigenous people in Canada. We would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather, which is the traditional unceded and unsurrendered land of the Willistic Wake and Passamaquoddy people. This territory is covered by a series of peace and friendship treaties, which Malasi and Malachi people first signed with the British Crown in 1725. These treaties did not deal with the surrendered land or resources. Rather, they recognized the Mi'kmaq and Malasi's title to the land and established the rule for what, for what was to go on um, to be ongoing relationships between nations. Over the years, the impact of residential schools was completely overlooked by the non-Indigenous community. Children being taken from their homes, stripped of their clothes and culture, and being left to feel completely alone. This was still happening only 24 years ago, a little over two decades ago, leaving the indigenous people with intergenerational harm and grievance. New Brunswick played a part in the horrific part of our history as well by operating day schools, which all had the same purpose as residential schools. The Sussex Valley School was established in 1794 and the last day of school wasn't until 1992. We recognize and acknowledge the horrific history that has brought us to truth and reconciliation. Um, I do want to take the time to sincerely apologize for this history um, from our country, which has forced you to mourn the loss of young children, your culture for many years, and mourn for many years to come. So I am very sorry. The UMB Students' Representative Council sees post-secondary institutions paving a fatal, fatal path towards reconciliation. Referencing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 2015 report, various calls to action mention how post-secondary institutions can act in order to advance the process of Canadian reconciliation. Calls to action 16, 24, 28, and 86 directly call on the post-secondary institutions to make institutional changes to programs that lead to various key professions, such as nursing and law, and incorporate historical knowledge and intercultural competency training into programming. If you are not familiar with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, it is definitely worth the read, and I strongly encourage you to do so. I felt uncomfortable coming up here today until I realized that today is a day to feel uncomfortable. Today is a day to feel sad with our history and reflect on the horrific actions that took place and completely scarred the indigenous communities. If anything, take today to share these stories, get uncomfortable and work towards the truth and reconciliation. As the Student Representative Council and allies with the indigenous people in Canada, we wear our orange shirts with privilege and solidarity. Thank you, Charlotte and Kirsten, for, for sharing as well. Next, we have the Acting Dean, Michelle Gray, Faculty of Forestry and Environmental Management here at the Fredericton campus. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
I'm here representing my faculty, but also myself. Within our faculty, we've uh, established a Truth and Reconciliation Working Group more than four years ago, and more recently, it's been renamed as the Messike Working Group, which means to make things right. And beyond the activities of that working group, what we're trying to do in the faculty is create a safe space for Indigenous students to come and learn in our program. We feel that we share, within, with our connection to the environment and nature, we share some of the world, Indigenous worldviews. But we also want to create a space for non-Indigenous students to learn and understand more of the Indigenous history here in Canada. Um, personally, I've been able to participate in more than six blanket exercises over the past few years. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, you should Google it. But also um, seek opportunities to participate um, often, more than once. Every single time I've done them, I've learned something new and taken something else away from it. My very first experience was when I invited a guest speaker to my class. I had no idea what a blanket exercise was. And she handed me the script and said she would do the narration parts and I would read all the script parts. So I'd never seen the words or the text before. And so I'm reading, reading these and as we get to the part where it covers residential schools, I'm reading first person account survivor messages and I'm reading it while processing it in my head while looking at the next sentence wondering whether, I'm not, whether or not I'm gonna be able to say these words or not. So I was able to get through it and in the um, talking circle reflection after the blanket exercise, um, you're meant to talk about what hit you the hardest or what, what, you, you know, what you took away from it. And for me at that time, my children were younger and they were school age and I couldn't imagine someone coming to your house and taking your children and being powerless to stop that from happening. So, but every, every time I've done the blanket exercise, you take something different. Um, on a personal note, I myself am adopted, which means I have zero shared experiences, but I only mention it that my biological parents were able to have the choice to give my sister and myself up for adoption, but there are so many Indigenous mothers and fathers that were never given that choice. So today, I wear an orange shirt for Phyllis and for the residential school survivors and victims, and we share in your grief, and we want to promise to walk together on the path of reconciliation. I too have an offering for a young person. I saw there was a, a little child back there. I'll bring the offering over to share that with you afterwards. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so right now I want to thank, of course, all of the, the elders that are here. They share their stories with us. I want to thank the pres president for for sharing his uh, thoughts as well. And of course, to the deans and of course to the student representatives, thank you all for, for sharing your thoughts on this important day. So next, um, we will have, uh, I'll ask Charles Nicholas, Elder Charles Nicholas, to come up and, and I think it's appropriate to have a healing song for, for those who lost their lives, those children who lost their lives in the residential schools, and for the survivors as well. So Charles will be sharing the healing song for them, and, 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 and we just let, let, them, let the survivors know and the spirits of the children know that, that they are, that we're thinking about them and we pray for them, and we will we'll be there to support them at all times. Way. I would like to ask everybody please stand for this song. If you can't stand, that's very that's okay as well too, because I have bad hips and sometimes I gotta sit when I have to stand, so I understand. The healing song. It's time to reflect. Time to realize that truth is being spoken here today. History is about to change across Canada today and we all need healing each and every one of us especially the children and the survivors of residential school and day school it's a healing song please close your eyes and listen with your heart
Oliwan, Oliwan Elder Charles Nicholas for the healing song. Um, this is what uh, reconciling action is all about, healing for, for our survivors and, of course, recognizing that our, that our children, their spirits now are in, are in our Creator's sac sacred lodge. So we have to remind, remind them that we're thinking about them as well. So you can have a seat now if you want. <clears throat> so now we have, um, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Diego Bear and Ablasomas to uh, unveil the Wabanaki language app. Now that's, uh, to me, that's, I think this is important because one of the targets of residential schools was, of course, our language. They took our language away. They were determined to take language away from the Wabanaki people, the Mi'kmaq and Wulastigwig and Passamaquoddy, Penobscots, and so on. So, it's, so for me, when I see a revival of our language in contemporary society, that's, that's also reminding everyone that at one time, our language was being attacked. So, uh, Diego and the Blossom West. Before Diego shows off his amazing technical skills, he's taken language to an entire new level. When our ancestors talked about smoke signals as sending messages, Diego found a way to revive what smoke signal means in the tech world. And so he's been able to lift up, carry, and make sure that it survives for future generations. So I am so grateful, but I need to gift him with a pair of moccasins because he's walking the talk. He's carrying the language. He's making sure that his skills that he's learning here on, at UNB will be lifting up those who want their language, who are so hungry for their language. And I don't mean just indigenous students, and learners. Rita Joe, a Mi'kmaq elder who was at Shubi, she wrote a poem and saying, you took my talk. Now I talk like you. I create like you. I speak like you. But I gently offer my hand to you. Learn my talk. Speak like me. And create like me. And this is what Diego's been able to do. I had beadwork done in the same way that um, the work that he's doing. So it's as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. Thanks to you, Gus, our language will survive. Because Elmo. I'll let him talk the talk. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Thank you so much. But um, now we will begin to demonstrate our application. We have a pre-recording demonstration we'd like to show off. I believe we should be able to show that on the screens. Um, on the Hello. Welcome to this short demonstration we've prepared for our new Willis Way Language Learning application. This new app is designed to run on the web as well as mobile devices but it can also be installed on desktop devices as well. In this application, Imelda Purley, UNB's former elder in residence and a fluent speaker of Willis Way, narrates hundreds of Willis Way words and phrases to immerse listeners in Willis Way language and culture. The primary language content of this application is sorted into many topical categories to help teach users various aspects of the Willis Way language. Mili ono kakio, a jig den nagisk, nibai miyamk, biligdak, jugik wusnan, abajibek, ksautamul dimak, munim kwas, gilohud. In addition to audio narrations, we also include text content to help teach application users how to read and write in a list way. For this, we include support for both the Newell Hale and Teeter rating systems.
realize it can sometimes be difficult for new language learners to learn how to pronounce the list way of words from text, we also include a pronunciation guide to aid in user understanding of the Willis Way language. For users to be able to test their understanding of language, we also include a quiz component designed to assist users in learning the language. This quiz contains thousands of potential questions of diverse types and tests not only content related to text, but also audio content as well. Oh, this dog. So if we click through this quiz, we can observe that this application includes questions of many different types. Specifically, we ask questions related to translation, being able to convert some word or phrase from Willis Way to English, or from English to Willis Way. We also include phonics related questions, uh, asking users to identify what word is being spoken and also what sound is missing from a word. To allow the quiz component of our application to be as versatile as possible, we also allow users to customize their quiz to make it more in line with the aspects of language they are currently trying to learn. Part of our application also includes a brief overview of language history. If you're interested in learning more about this application, please visit the Wabanaki Collections website where this app is hosted. The online version of this application works on a wide variety of devices, including mobile and desktop. App Store versions of this application will soon be available. However, currently only the legacy version of this application, which does not contain the most up-to-date features, is on the App Store. So that was a short demonstration of our application. We hope our application will aid in revitalization efforts. We've identified many use cases for our application. Uh, it's optimized for individual users, but we also believe it will have a great impact in schools. Currently, this application is now available on the Wabanaki Collections website. It works on mobile devices, which includes phones and tablets, but also works on desktop devices as well and can be installed on the desktop for offline use. We do not have the App Store versions of the application available yet, but they will soon be available on the iOS App Store and Google Play Store. Uh, do we have any questions regarding the application? If not, then... Just to, uh, what a gift to leave behind Diego. And Dr. Paul, thank you for guiding him. And also for Natasha for making sure that some of the funding that was set aside for language revival was uh, dedicated to, to uh, this project. So I give gratitude and I continue to see more language. So there's no excuse, people. The second book after Rita Joe wrote it was, I Found My Talk. And so let's find our talk. Okay. Thank you, uh, Diego. Thank you, Abdullah And uh, I forgot to mention that Diego is a member of Tobik First Nation. He's, in the, uh, he's enrolled in the computer science program here at UNB and he's going to be an important part of language revival look, um, using his skills to be able to use technology to revive our language. Because of the language policies of residential schools, Wabanaki languages now are considered to be endangered languages. So we have to reverse that language loss, that process of language loss, and, and put more work into, it, into reviving our language our Mi'kmaq language within the communities, our Wolastikwe languages and so on. So um, I'm looking forward to, uh, we have, a, there's a sense of hope now that our language will indeed be revived with, because of the, the skills that our young people are bringing back to the First Nations communities. Will even Diego? 
Well, they wouldn't have lost in West. Next, we, I think uh, the I think did we agree on having the uh, the closing prayer before the honor song? Don't they? Closing prayer. Don't they? You're probably wondering why you're holding those blank hearts. <laughs> I think the intent was after you've heard our speakers and the songs and uh, the hope that you would consider what would your heart say today to make sure that reconciliation action is going to continue to survive. And so your thoughts, your promises, your actions, uh, you could, while the song is being sung, you can write that in and you could either take it home or leave it up here as a memorial as well. Um, I, I know um, uh, there are so many places that need memorials. We've been sending out these prayer ties and uh, tributes will be featured uh, there are two classes of teachers that proudly and hesitantly at the beginning because of how difficult it was when we asked them to write tributes to our children so that as teachers, let's promise that we're going to have a new breed of teachers that won't offend, that won't abuse, that won't neglect, but will genuinely, genuinely love teaching that student regardless of where they come from and regardless of what language they speak. And so we'll, we'll be putting those tributes together and um, I, I, I've actually already asked Theatre New Brunswick to do an entire production of tributes from the new breed of teachers in our province um, to kind of heal the ones who weren't so great at teaching. And so that'll be an ongoing journey. And stay tuned. UNB is full of surprises, and our communities are uh, 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 thanking all our allies that will do that. So in closing, Mullahs welcome to Galoza Chibankiskak. Mullahs welcome to Chibsub Suhune Pizon Gnamitug. Well, the woman met to feed our spirits in the harvest of the love that we share as a human family and to give gratitude to the four-legged family for giving us that sustenance and that nourishment. May this season continue to light the way for us towards the winter that's coming so that we can write the stories of truth and reconciliation for those yet to be born. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. May we walk for the ones who can't walk. May we see for the ones who can't see. May we hear the languages that were almost extinct. And may we feel the genuine love we're feeling right now. Waliwan, walalin, merci, apchich. Well, even the blossom was. Um, so, so now I'd like to ask George, Elder George Paul, to sing the honor song. And as you listen to the song, keep in mind that today is a day for learning. It's a day for mourning. It's a day for re reflecting on the past, as well as, uh, when, as well as going what we want to do for the future. And of course, it's a, a day to know more about Wabanaki histories, Wabanaki worldviews, Wabanaki contributions. 
treaty rights of our of our um, of, of the Wabanaki nations and so on. So think about that as you listen to George's honor song for those children who lost their lives. Uh, they, they when they left when they were forced to to they were taken away from their parents. They had a language. They had traditions. They practiced ceremonies before they left but they were separated from their culture, from their elders, from their parents. And then when they went to the, when they were forced to go to residential schools, it was bad enough that, that they took them away from the parents, but some of those children didn't survive, some of them died, and we have to, and I get emotional when I think about this because they weren't sent back to the First Nations community so that the parents and the elders and the community can, so can, can send off their spirits in the traditional way. So as you think, as you listen to his story, think about those children who were not, who were not brought back to the communities and they were not allowed, they, the parents were not allowed to, to use their ceremonies and traditions to send, the, send their spirits to Creator's Sacred Lodge. George, will you even? Thank you, Dave. Um, <clears throat> I just want to mention something. Uh, uh, I attended a ceremony yesterday over in Ilver Bar. There were two men from out in Saskatchewan that traveled all the way over by vehicle to get to get to uh, Ilver Bar and to do ceremonies there uh, for the children that have been found, the children that were were buried and, and not um, returned to their parents. And w one of them uh, had a vision, and um, it was a vision of um, how that all come about as a result of that, um, all this um, work was put together to uh, investigate and, and to find all the missing children, the children that were buried in, in behind or around or in the fields near those residential schools. And um, it started with uh, 215, but in, in his vision they said there was, it was approached by a, a little girl and about um, 10 years old and the Spirit spoke to them and told them about how to go about it. Anyway, it's a beautiful story. I don't really have much time to tell about it, but the experience that I had there, it was, it was very emotional as well. And now we know the number is way up to, I think it's over 2,000, or is it up to 3,000? They're finding more and more children that were that were buried, you know, and not, not even returned home to their parents. They wondered whatever happened to them. And so, <clears throat> um, in memory of that, and to honor all the um, uh, children that were lost as a result of that experience. But now it's put to light and everything is coming together in, in a much educated and, and a, a very positive way, you know, and to reconcile and deal with the, the abuses of uh, indigenous people here in Canada and also the United States and everywhere in the world for that matter. I mean, we're a human family. We should know better than that. We should have more decency and, and we should have more intellect than to abuse people in, 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 that, in that way. I think we're getting at a much higher level now. And so with that, <clears throat> this song came to me because I cried for my people and I wanted to do something to help revive our traditions, customs, and our values, and to rid ourselves of the miseries that are hanging on to us sometimes, alcohol and drug abuse and 
and all of those negative things in, in life that hold us down, to free ourselves from that so that we can have honor and respect for each other, dignity, and who we are as, as people.
like for you to join me in this chant. And I'm going to slow it down so we can all sing the chant together. And this chant part is just me crying. And I was really crying. I cried all day because that pain was in my heart for my people, for our children. And I wanted to see my future generation children dancing to their traditional songs, being proud of who they are, what, what the Creator has given us to be upon Mother Earth. Be proud of our culture, celebrating that life with the songs and dances of our ancestors. <clears throat> so if you can dig down deep inside your soul and your heart and reach down and, and sing it really loud for honor and respect for all of us as a human family. Way recess time so you can so you're allowed to sing really loud <laughs> But we're going to get real, we're going to get really powerful. Everything is going to be really loud in here pretty soon, okay? Okay, you're free, okay? Nobody's holding you down. I mean, you can sing really loud all you want right now. But think about it, okay? This is your freedom, is your honor and respect, okay, for who you are as people. So sing it out loud. It doesn't matter if you sing it wrong, it don't matter. Just sing loud. Way away. Thank you. And I think, I'm not sure it's because, is, is there restrictions against, uh, for uh, not, not singing? Is that why you're not sh sh singing out loud? 
So anyway, I want to thank uh, George for, for the, uh, the song, the honor song. And just a reminder before we close, uh, just a reminder that you have your orange hearts. Uh, you have uh, a choice of having those orange hearts hung at the, uh, the lodge in the back over here, or you can take them with you and, and then maybe paste them on a window so that other people will see and, and know that you're, that you're honoring and paying tribute to the children who lost their lives in residential schools. Waliwan, Walalin, merci. Share it with your social media. Okay, anybody that's on social media, share your heart message to social media. I think that will resound in a really beautiful way. Thank you. <laughs>